Hi, everyone. So we're just going to give it one more minute or so before we get started. Thank you so much for joining us at our um, INS Teleneuropsychology SIG Meet the Experts talk. Um, so we're just going to give it one more minute. All right, so I have that it is two past the hour here. There may be still a few people trickling in, but um, I wanna make sure that we're being respectful of everyone's time and for those individuals who manage to um, have the opportunity to click the link on time. So my name is Dr. Michelle Medor. I am a neuropsychologist at VA Palo Alto Healthcare System and a clinical assistant professor at Stanford University School of Medicine, and I will be your moderator for today's Meet the Expert. With that being said, let's meet our expert. So today we have Dr. Dustin Hammers. He's a board certified clinical neuropsychologist and associate professor in the Department of Neurology at Indiana University. He has authored and co-authored multiple book chapters on teleneuropsychology and has provided numerous presentations on the topic both nationally and internationally since 2020. Additional research include assessing cognitive change over time and examining diagnostic consistency between cognitive and imaging data in Alzheimer's disease. He currently serves as the Associate Editor of Developmental Neuropsychology and Grand Rounds Editor of The Clinical Neuropsychologist. He is the past chair of the APA Committee on Rural Health and currently serves as the liaison to the Committee on Aging, also known as CONA, for the Public Interest Advisory Committee of the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology. So with that, I'd like to turn the reins over to Dr. Hammers. Michelle, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for tuning in uh, as part of the INS Teleneuropsych SIG. I'm excited to talk with you today about some of my research uh, over the past couple years. And I, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, and over the next hour, what I'd like to talk with you about is, the, uh, is some background about uh, teleneuropsychology and telehealth usage, but not gonna go into that too, in too much detail given the, the focus of the group is already on teleservices, not gonna waste your time there, but uh, really wanna spend my time uh, overviewing the manuscript that myself, Renee Stoltwick, Lana Harder, and Monroe Cullum put together and published in TCN last summer, uh, which is connected with the, the name of the talk here, a survey of international clinical teleneuropsychology service provision prior to and in the context of COVID-19. So I wanna talk you, with you about the specific results, uh, going to talk about the methods that we used, uh, and then would really like for probably half the time to have this be more of an open discussion on what this may mean for implications for the field, both specifically our study results, but in general, COVID-19 implications for the field and the use of teleneuropsych currently and moving forward. And um, not exactly sure how many folks we have on the call, but would love to also get your sense of experiences with teleneuro uh, currently and in the early days of the pandemic, um, as we are, what, uh, about 18, 19 months uh, into, uh, into the, the pandemic response. So who am I? Uh, why am I presenting on this? Um, I'm someone who happened to have some involvement with uh, tele-services prior to the pandemic. 
Um, I was actually, I've been at the Indiana University for the past six months, but prior to that, I was at the University of Utah from 2011 to 2021. And during that time, we had a joint relationship, a, a service uh, with a hospital in Jackson, Wyoming, uh, St. John's Institute, where we would conduct teleservices, uh, teleneuropsychology services uh, to that hospital. And over, over the 11 years that it was in existence, from 20, 2009 to 2020, we saw over 400 patients. And so I was able to develop a lot of experience with tele during that time when a lot of other people weren't ex having a lot of experience with tele, which was uh, very fortunate for me. And uh, actually, I, I directed and led that service uh, from about 2015 uh, until uh, I left uh, recently. But then additionally, like a lot of us, when March of 2020 hit or soon thereafter, our clinics needed to think quickly on their feet and respond to a need. And so our University of Utah, the traditional neuropsychology clinic, also expanded into uh, using video conference for both direct to home services, as well as uh, some remote in-clinic hybrid services. And then from, a, from taking it out of the hands of just pure neuropsychology, from a psychological standpoint, we were also doing a number of services related to psychodiagnostic evaluations directly into the home or providing therapy or feedback for folks. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes just on some basics related to the prevalence of the use of televideo conference prior to COVID. And I'm gonna start out with telemedicine because um, this is where much more rich data exists. And we know that from about 2005 to 2014, the use of tele was really taking off. Uh, annual visits increasing by about 52% each year. Uh, which is no real surprise. Uh, even before the pandemic, we were starting to see local hospitals uh, offering advertisements for um, if you have a fever or if your child has a fever, you can talk to a local physician to get some information on what that may be. And some of the data here from the use of, um, use of telehealth uh, from the American Hospital Association indicates from 2010 to 2017, we actually saw a twofold, over a twofold increase in the number of hospitals that were incorporating teleservices into their models. And none of this information is really novel now to us compared to 18 months ago, but as far as from a primary care standpoint, patients generally liked telemedicine. They thought it was, 80% thought it was uh, more convenient in terms of scheduling and 83% felt that the, the service was just as good or the care was just as good. And two in three people felt that they had a, a good connection with their telehealth practitioner, which again, though, this is not necessarily psychological services. This is uh, private, or I'm sorry, this is more um, uh, practitioner involvement. So uh, slight differences there. But then um, Robert Glukoff came out with a study in 2018 where he was actually looking at service provision rates in telepsychology and found overall that, um, that while most people were currently not providing any kind of video conference service, so 52%, in general, they would be comfortable doing so to a moderately or to a very, uh, very large amount. And so this is suggesting that while people were not necessarily engaging in tele at the time, although some were, while um, they, they felt like this could be something that they'd be interested in, in going to in the future. However, 57% of those individuals surveyed felt that they still would wanna conduct an intake in person first. And uh, naturally based on desires to establish a firm therapeutic alliance and have a, a good rapport with individuals. And then some additional information from that Glukoff uh, practitioner survey was that while only again, about 25% of those individuals that he surveyed used video conference over the preceding year, 72% felt that uh, it would be useful in theory, and it's something that they, that they would consider. 
So that was tele in general. And then we're talking about telepsychology. But what about teleneuropsychology? And there's very, very limited data on that prior to the onset of COVID. There was one study from Jody Chapman and colleagues who uh, she is a, uh, uh, she's a, a researcher in Australia and she examined uh, doctorate and master's level neuropsychologists in 2018. And what she generally found was that there was not that much engagement using teleneuropsychology. Only uh, less than one in 10 providers use it for either clinical interview or the testing session itself and maybe one in five use it for feedback or intervention. Uh, they were additionally able to identify though that there were a number of barriers that were present for service utilization. And this was actually a pretty seminal study to establish some of the groundwork for a future investigation into teleneuropsychology. Um, and a lot of factors related to concerns about the validity of the evaluations, what resources or what changes would be necessary in modifying someone's practice, reduce confidence in the ability to do so, and just pure skepticism about any kind of break from tradition. And so this is all the data up through uh, 2018. And as of January 2020, there, there still existed no tangible data to identify rates of teleneuropsychology. And actually, in February of 2020, a colleague of mine, uh, Renee Stolwick, we presented uh, an INS uh, CE in, um, why I'm blanking, I'm wanting to say Boston, but I, I could be, uh, I could be, actually, no, Denver, I'm sorry. Uh, we presented a, a CE in Denver on a practical guide to ethics and practice of rural health and teleneuropsychology. And we started having preliminary discussions on developing some survey data because there was no good data that existed and there was a strong pressing need. However, we all know what happened within a month of, uh, uh, of INS in 2020. Onset of the COVID pandemic, which obviously changed everything. I don't, I don't need to describe that to this audience. And so in April of 2020, given the relationship that Renee and I had with INS and the success that we had with that CE, we were asked to put together a webinar specifically on teleneuropsych in response to COVID-19. And with that, we, uh, we used the opportunity to, to reach out to some of our other colleagues, uh, Lana Harder and Monroe Cullum, to be involved with that. And in particular, so, that is getting us up to April 2020. And we found that that was going to be a very successful and highly interested webinar, obviously because of COVID. Everyone is scrambling to figure out what to do. We actually had 3,800 registrants uh, within a week of the seminar, a week of the webinar. And this reflected a perfect opportunity to collect some data on this topic at a time when teleneuropsych services were especially safe. And so the survey that we put together was a 26 item survey that was inspired by Jody Chapman and colleagues uh, 2020 survey of Australian provider involvement. And it asked questions generally in a yes, no format. Um, majority of the questions were in a yes, no format, specifically getting at demographic information. And then the focus was on the provision of teleneuropsychology services and provider intentions. And most of the questions were based on, have you ever used video technology to conduct psychological, neuropsychological, or medical services? And this was done for clinical interview, for the neuropsych testing portion, for the feedback portion, and for conducting any interventions. And then there were three timelines that we were examining. The first was prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and then following the COVID-19 pandemic, which we can talk about some uh, how that question was interpreted. And given just the, the general chaos, I think it's fair to say, of clinical services and, and clinical response to uh, COVID-19, uh, seeming like every day was a new decision tree that, that uh, clinics were having to, to face. Uh, this 
the time period between the reaching out of conducting this, uh, this webinar and actually doing so was extremely brief, certainly the briefest of my career, about a week to a week and a half. And so we had this idea that this would be a great opportunity to get some survey data, but we did not have any type of timeline that we could pilot some of these questions prior to their dissemination during the survey. And so the aims of the study and the aims of the survey really was to establish a baseline for future examination of teleneuropsych practices and to more comprehensively uh, document the provision of neuro, teleneuro services over time. And also to, to briefly understand some provider concerns in the context of COVID-19. And so our sample, uh, for anyone who has read the study, uh, read the, the manuscript, our sample was a little quirky, I think it's fair to say. Um, our, we, and, and so, with all aspects of telehealth service, it was kind of a good, uh, a good example where planning is secondary to the whims of technology. And so what we were doing was uh, we were wanting to provide this survey to the, uh, to the members of the webinar. We did not know that the service platform that we were using, uh, I'm sorry, not the service platform, but the, um, the webinar platform that we were using um, had different applications and different abilities to record. And so as a result, although we started out with 3,800 individuals, we were only able to record response percentages and the number of attendees remaining at the, um, at the time of the administration of the survey. So we did not actually have the ability to identify the exact number of participants who are completing the survey. And obviously that is a limitation to this survey, but given the fact that zero data existed about this topic prior to this point, um, uh, Mark Hapolis and, and uh, 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 Gutman, I believe, um, who have provided some, some seminal work on survey use in teleneuro and in neuropsychology. Um, even they have a quote in their manuscript about uh, when we are faced with a topic that has basically no information and no funding to obtain said information. Um, studies with, uh, with methodological flaws should still be considered for, uh, for purposes of baseline and information. And so we felt comfortable moving forward despite this particular limitation. And so what we ended up seeing was that of the 3,800 individuals who were registered for the webinar, um, about 600 actually did not attend the webinar, but still about 3,100 individuals did. And um, there was naturally some attrition over the two hours and 19 minutes of the survey. And, but by the time we got to the hour and an hour, hour to hour and a half point where we administered the survey, we still had approximately 2,400 individuals. And I can go into some details later about how we came up with a survey sample estimate. Um, it's probably more for the discussion uh, timeline, but we estimated uh, based on some metrics used that about 600 to 1,000 individuals were part of our survey. And the recruitment for the survey, as I've alluded to before, was directly related to the webinar that we were providing. And so the recruitment sources and advertisements for the webinar were in fact the recruitment sources for, for the survey. So to, uh, to recruit for the webinar, INS reached out to all INS members, which is a significant benefit because we were able to get individuals from across the globe as compared to just specifically within the United States. And so um, both INS membership and word of mouth as well. And individuals did not have any compensation provided for taking part in the survey. I mean, this was a non-probability survey because we did not have an understanding of the, um, of the sampling frame as a result of uh, both, uh, both word of mouth individuals and uh, um, some of the technological glitches that we had. 
And the survey was, and as I alluded to before, the survey was administered around the hour to an hour and a half mark of the presentation. And at that point, we still had 74% of the attendees were present, uh, which as we can discuss a little later on, if it happens to come up, is a, is a really high uh, rate of people attending that late into such a long presentation. In fact, the average attendance time of 3,100 individuals was an hour and 45 minutes, which is, uh, given attention spans and demands on people's time, we were really surprised by that. And the, the respondents themselves, 82% classified themselves as being a neuropsychologist. Uh, and again, the, the word of mouth component uh, would have also influenced likely some other individuals as well, uh, medical providers, uh, other medical providers or psychologists in general. 75% of the individuals classified themselves as a non-student non clinical provider, so not students. 20% were students and 5% considered themselves neither to be a student or a, uh, or a, a provider. We can see that 67% of our sample came from the US, not a surprise. INS is a global group. However, it's a very heavy United States base. Um, and when we're combining Canada and Europe, uh, we are, uh, well, uh, when we're combining Canada, we're looking at about 75% of the sample is from North America. And Europe represented about another 12%, South America 8%, Australia 3% which I think the Australia 3% uh, is connected with Renee Stolwick, one of our presenters, being uh, at the uh, Monash University in Australia. So for the question, so getting into some of our results, for the question of have you ever used video technology to conduct psychological, neuropsychological, or medical services? What we found was that it, again, blue bars being prior to COVID-19, orange bars being since the onset of COVID-19, and yellow bars being following COVID-19. So for the blue bars, prior to the onset of COVID-19, we found that about a quarter of the sample reported using teleneuropsych for either the interview, feedback, or interventions. And about one in 10 individuals used teleneuropsych for cognitive testing portion. Those numbers increase about from 44% to 116% increases early on in the days of the COVID pandemic. So this, uh, this webinar was April, yeah, April 2nd. And so if we think about the fact that uh, my, my mental benchmark is always that the NBA canceled its season on March 11th. And personally, my clinic uh, our clinics at the University of Utah closed March 16th. So we're talking two to three weeks into the pandemic response. And we're seeing that rates of clinical interview from our sample went from 24 to 52% and um, jumps of uh, 18, uh, 28 to 41 for feedback and 25 to 36 for intervention, which is still a 44% increase right there. However, the cognitive testing component really didn't change. Uh, 11 to 11 to 15 percent. That remained lagging. And uh, we also found that for the question of for the future question, which again, we can we can um, try to interpret. So following COVID-19, there was kind of some naivete that the quarantine may last a month and then we'll be back to normal. Um, obviously, that hasn't happened. So how are people interpreting following COVID-19? But uh, we found that the vast majority of individuals were expecting to implement virtual video conference services moving forward. 70 to 90 percent for the, the interview, feedback, or intervention portions, and even six, uh, pretty much 60 percent for individuals uh, using cognitive uh, for cognitive testing. One piece that's actually interesting, and I, and I never incorporated it into any of the figures in the paper was that only 18% of respondents felt that they were ever going to use technicians or in-home video conference testing, which is a, which for us at the University of Utah, we were using a technician model and I use a technician model here at Indiana University. And so that is something that I'm, I'm curious if that's changed over time. 
So our data co corresponds pretty well to two other surveys that were occurring at the exact same time. It's always, I mean, it's no surprise given the uh, precedent of the, of the COVID pandemic that uh, multiple groups are having similar thoughts about trying to understand and trying to move the field forward as far as service provision virtually. Uh, there were two surveys that were conducted right about, I mean, within a week of when our survey was conducted. Uh, so late March, early April, 2020. And one survey from AACN who examined uh, board certified neuropsychologists found that about two thirds of respondents were either conducting or planning to conduct tele teleservices for some component of the service provision. So about three quarters were either intending to use or using for clinical interview, two thirds for feedback and one third for cognitive testing. Now, one, unfortunately that survey combined conducting or planning to conduct in the same question. So we don't actually know how many people were conducting uh, tele prior to COVID-19. And that wasn't the focus of their presentation, or focus of their survey, but we don't quite know. Um, and at the same time, another survey by Mara and colleagues uh, looked at US neuropsychologists, uh, about 230 individuals, and found that about half of a sample, half of their sample conducted neuropsych uh, teleservices, I'm sorry, they conducted teleservices for intakes and feedback, but without testing. 14% uh, reported it for some testing and only 3% reported for conducting tele video conferences for a full neuropsychological evaluation. And these numbers, realistically, these numbers map on pretty well with the data that we were getting. Um, so co uh, consequently, despite some of the concerns we had with some of the technological glitches within our sample, um, there seems to be a, a confluence of information suggesting that a lot of people were incorporating uh, for clinical interview, feedback and cognitive testing, but not as much for, uh, I'm sorry, for, not as much for cognitive testing. And then another question that we had was, and this is gonna be the last, study, uh, the last slide on the results uh, before we talk about impact for a couple minutes and then kind of open things up. But uh, we finally, we were trying to inquire about what are the biggest drivers of people's concern as of the early days of the pandemic? And the majority of the individuals tuning in and completing our survey were, uh, well, actually not the, the majority, 45% were primarily concerned with patient access. About 40% were concerned with validity of video conference evaluations, which is fair. And about 16% were primarily concerned with clinical revenue, which um, a, a thriving clinical practice needs to keep its doors open to continue to thrive and, and serve the needs of the public. So that's a very understandable concern. Regardless of which category these individuals fell into for this pie chart, um, the majority of participants, or I'm sorry, the majority of respondents still expressed ethical concerns about the use of teleneuropsychology for testing directly into a patient's home. And that actually corresponds with a lot of the literature up to that point that um, any of the validity studies for televideo conference were generally conducted in a clinic just down the hall, the, provi the provider was in a different room from the patient. And when you're conducting services directly into someone's home, which we can talk about if, if uh, questions arise later, that opens up a whole new avenue of some, um, some decision trees and ethical decisions that need to be made. And so in terms of impact for, this, uh, for the results of this study, uh, we were able to be the, first study to establish or document rates of global and US teleneuropsychology service provision occurring prior to COVID-19. And we establish a baseline of what was happening in the early days of the pandemic as well. However, and, and consequently, um, there was a lot of demand for service at the start of COVID-19. And as we all know, there 
is no way to put the toothpaste back in the, uh, in the tube as far as video conferencing services. This presentation alone would likely not have happened two years ago, but this would have been a local presentation to a specific group. The, the use of Zoom, the use of video technology has just been incorporated into our lives. And so it's likely that teleneuropsychology services are gonna continue and have a high demand moving forward. But we don't exactly know that. And another, another impact of the use of teleneuro is the fact that we now have increased rates of trainees developing experience with teleservices. Uh, I certainly didn't have that on my postdoc. Uh, when, I, when I started at the University of Utah, it was kind of a, um, um, this is a really interesting modality, a way to reach out to people, and we kind of learned as we went along. And so the likelihood that student trainees who are developing this, this skill now, the likelihood that they're going to continue to use that moving forward is, only, is, is high, which is only going to influence the rates of teleneuropsychology service provision in the future. But we, the question still is out there. Is this a temporary change in practice, or is this true acceptance of teleneuropsychology? And uh, we and so we and therefore we needed to document these uh, these rates prior to being able to understand change and trends in the field. And as far as future goals, um, and this is actually one of my last slides. This is the results of a PubMed search for teleneuropsychology that I did a few days ago. And from 2011 to 2019, we had a total of 10 publications that examined teleneuropsychology. And then you can see 2020. So in 2020, we had 22 publications. And in 2021, so far alone, which this is only October, we had 29 publications. But you can imagine that over the fall, the next three months, uh, there's going to be even more. And the trend is going to continue moving forward. So there's been an obvious expansion of teleneuropsychology research. However, there's been no additional service utilization data since uh, those three studies are set, the one that we're talking about now and the two others, since April, March of 2020. And actually, um, I, Renee, Monroe, Lana, and I uh, are talking about this because there is a strong need for data on long-term trends of teleneuropsychology usage after, after the, the COVID-19 shutdown. I mean, we're currently living in a, who knows, are, are we living in a, in a transition time? Um, is this going to, is what, how we're providing services now, is this going to change and revert back to pre-2020? Or is this the new future and the new status quo? And so uh, we are, yeah, we are in uh, talks and we're, we're moving forward with data collection on a follow-up to this original survey. And so with that, I'm, I'm open to, I'm uh, curious to get individuals' experiences and, and answer any questions. And again, the, the goal, let me see, we have about 25 minutes left and uh, um, I intentionally ended early and briefly so that uh, we can kind of open things up. And I'm going to just throw it on to, I have a, a host of resources, but obviously there needs to be a video conference joke in my thank you, which I'll include now. And so, um, and so uh, Michelle, I'm not quite sure how you'd like to, to manage this moving forward. Um, sure. I'm, I'm open to, to whatever. So thank you Absolutely. everyone for your time. I hope that this was informative. Thanks so much, Dustin, for a wonderful presentation. We do have um, at least one question in the Q&A that I'm happy to read aloud. Uh, individuals who have other questions or would like to share some of their experiences with teleneuropsychology, um, please do so and indicate um, that you'd like to do so in the chat. So for our first question, it starts with a uh, great presentation, which I agree. Um, the question says, I was wondering if there are any findings in terms of the neuropsychologist's location of practice and their impact on the provision of telehealth. And so they make a comment that um, the DOD did not adapt to virtual testing, whereas uh, within VA, uh, we do have a, our own kind of teleneuropsychology 
SIG, if you will, um, and that private practices appeared to have ad adapted to telehealth fairly quickly, as opposed to some of the larger healthcare systems. That is a fantastic question, and that is uh, that is spot on. So, um, the one of the reasons I included uh, and, and had it mentioned my uh, involvement in the APA Committee on Rural Health uh, prior to COVID nineteen was specifically because um, I was kind of the the, the telepsych person on that committee at the time, and and I had I was able to keep my finger on the pulse of what was going on in rural communities. And we, you're right, we absolutely know that although teleneuropsychology data was unknown prior to COVID-19, we know that VAs were incorporating video assessment much more rapidly and were much more mobile uh, to be able to, uh, to, to mobilize for these services. Um, I believe the MARA study may have some information about location of service utilization. Um, I would, uh, let me, do I have the, uh, do I have the citation? Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, MARA et al. 2020. I believe they speak to, uh, to some of that, but there weren't necessarily any specific, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, we don't actually have great data on, um, on exactly the difference between VA versus DOD versus uh, academic centers versus private practice uh, for that. It's just, there's a, there's a paucity of information. Uh, it would seem that likely that the service utilization was higher there, but I don't believe we have the data specifically on that. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, so I wanna continue to encourage everyone to ask questions. Um, oh, so there's another comment, so I'll go ahead and read that. The person apologizes they have to run to another meeting, um, but as a trainee getting a lot of teleneuropsychology experience over the last year, I really appreciated getting to hear your perspective and to hear about the rationale and results of the survey. Um, also, just wanted to plug a recent survey published by uh, Josh Fox Fuller and um, Preeti Pre Pre and and I apologize, I'm about to butcher her last name, Sudararaman and colleagues. Um, and I'm gonna ask her to correct me when we're done because it's really important for me to be able to pronounce people's names correctly. Um, and colleagues at BUMC Columbia, where their sample size was a lot smaller, but the data was collected between December 2020 and February of 2021. Um, so it provides us with more of a mid pandemic uh, result. And I'm gonna, kind of share the DOI in the chat for everyone. Um, so there's also a similar study to ours done by Rochette and colleagues as well. So this was more of a, a comment of an appreciativeness and um, providing some context of another study. Um, Joshua, first of all, thank you for including this. And I am incredibly apologetic, actually. I have no idea how I did not, um, I was, when I did my pub, uh, PubMed search a couple days ago. Um, I, I saw the other study of yours, uh, but I did not come across this one. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm very apologetic for that. That's, that's wonderful. The, the more data we can get is, uh, is fantastic. Yeah, um, Michelle, no worries about my name. It's Dr. Sundar Raman, uh, but you can call me Preeti. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, so Dustin, just to kind of uh, give you an idea, we did uh, conduct a, uh, you know, a survey study and we published it pretty recently, um, but it does have information on uh, the primary work settings, uh, the population types, uh, and we have broken it down. And the goals were slightly different. Like we wanted to uh, actually survey uh, how many people are doing cognitive assessments, what kind of uh, challenges are they encountering, and uh, how do we resolve it? And I think a second, uh, you know, bigger picture point was that we were not just interested in just clinical uh, uh, assessments, but also from a research perspective, because as a researcher, I had to adapt my entire study to, um, because of COVID to remote assessment. And it was really challenging because there was no guidelines for researchers. So that's how Josh and I, uh, we kind of um, really got in touch on Twitter and we had this idea of like, we need something for the field in terms of both clinical and research perspective. 
And I also want to acknowledge Stacey Anderson, who is um, attending today's webinar. She was also a co-author on the paper. Yeah. Thank you for uh, thank you for mentioning that and, and speaking about that. Um, that's that's very exciting. That is definitely the moment I get off of uh, the call here. I'm going to be checking that out. Uh, so congratulations to you. And I yeah I apologize that I did not see that. Um, from your study, would, would you mind? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, to answering the prior question, uh, what did you see in uh, private practice versus uh, VA, etc.? I'm just switching on my video. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So I actually had the paper open in front of me because as you were like talking about your data, I was like trying to compare it with the, sure, the data sure. we have. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but we had about, I think, um, you know, in terms of the primary work settings, uh, we had academic medical center as the highest, 37%, followed by private practice at 24%. Uh, and the university setting, a liberal arts college, academia, we combined that, and that was 18%. And VA Medical Center was 16, 16%. So that was fourth on the list. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, and, and it could be because of the sample, like we did not definitely have a high sample size. It was, um, I think, um, you know, about 74. We had, we did it in two. Um, Sports, but we had about 87 participants overall. And these were neuropsychologists, but also research assistants, grad students, who okay. was doing any kind of um, tele-neuropsych assessment. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. No, and I mean, what you are speaking to as well, another goal being the incorporation of uh, virtual assessments into research is something that um, I, our survey was very focused on clinical, uh, but it's just as important from a research standpoint. Uh, and I mean, whether we're talking, I mean, anyone's, any PI study, things became very impacted and very delayed. And if you're doing longitudinal data assessment already, something along the lines of ADNI or the ADRCs or anything along those lines, then it would be a significant uh, significant impact, uh, do, you, do you skip that assessment? Uh, and, and additionally, if you do the assessment, can you then make, uh, how, do you, how do you factor that data into prior comparisons? And how does, how does practice effects work if it's of a different modality in person versus virtual, that type of thing? Yeah, I think the next hot topic is the harmonization of data, right? Yes. <laughs> Traditional yeah. neuropsych versus uh, remote uh, data collected digitally, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now, thank you for speaking, uh, to, for pulling up some of those details. That's fantastic, I appreciate it. Sure. Muted, thanks so much, Preeti. We have another question in the box. Um, so thanks for your work in this area. Can you say a bit about the use of technicians versus not in a teleneuropsychology? Um, I've tried it and have found it to have mixed utility depending on the technician. Second part of the question, also, have you only worked with text or do you also test without when doing teleneuropsych? And just to, uh, thank you for the question, just to clarify, have you only worked with text or do you also test without text? Uh, when doing tele, I, I assume that's what you're meaning and not uh, test without virtual. Um, I am, the vast majority of my evaluations have been done using, okay, great, thank you. A vast majority of my evaluations uh, virtually have been done using a technician. And we have found that um, it's a, uh, well, the reality is that uh, our technicians, uh, for us to have the, the same level of, well, for us to have the confidence in their getting accurate clinical data, uh, we, we all feel that the, the bar is pretty high for our technicians to be, um, uh, to be signed off to work with patients in person. And so, uh, and our technicians actually were very interested in the idea of transitioning over to virtual um, I think both for reasons of, um, of novelty of practice, uh, 
um, as compared to giving the same tests in the same exact way in the same, every, uh, each day, a couple times a day. And um, also, much like, uh, what was it, 16% of our sample, there, there were also uh, desires to remain engaged and remain involved during the early days of the pandemic. And so we've always used technicians. Um, I'd, be, I'd be curious, and, and so with technicians, we really needed to make sure that these individuals um, had, uh, number one, they had to have a lot of, uh, they already did have a lot of interaction with us throughout the testing sessions. They always, uh, when we had a patient, we, they reach out a couple times uh, per session. Um, I would normally be there for the beginning during the clinical interview. So issues related to connectivity and some of the other tech factors, could, uh, I was present if there were anything, if there was anything that came up as far as that goes. Um, at, the and at the same time, in my consenting of individuals, I was able to provide a lot of the list of do's and don'ts in terms for patients in terms of, you know, don't test with your family member in the room, please turn your cell phone off, um, all of those all those kind of things. Um, please don't have this testing session in the car or when there's a party going on next door that we don't know about, that type of thing. And so I was able to, to assuage some of those things, but our technicians also had such a high level of confidence uh, that when, if and when things did come up, we were able to, uh, uh, they were able to use some clinical judgment on things. I hope that answers the question. Um, uh, Michelle or uh, Pretty, any? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? So we just recently started using techs here at VA Palo Alto, um, at least within our specialty kind of neuropsych clinic um, for transcranial magnetic stimulation pre and post assessments. Mm -hmm. um, and and it definitely is, is a little bit of an adventure and I feel I don't have as much experience with using text. So I am a little bit more hands-on and, and available um, for those assessments as much as possible. Um, I know that for our research study, we actually started recruiting during the pandemic and that was a multi-site trial. And so trying to teach these things via video to RAs across the United States has been a very unique uh, experience, so <laughs> to say the least. But now we're committed, and we're going to be doing a tele NP hybrid for all of the participants uh, in this particular study. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I think from a yeah from from a research perspective, I think yeah training of the RAs has been um, a nightmare. I've I kind of went in with a hybrid model where. I think fortunately I, I was, uh, so in my study, um, I was using the NIH toolbox. And then, so we had to kind of adapt it for remote assessment uh, where we wanted to see the participants uh, faces. And, and it was interesting because I think we learned a lot in that process about stimuli presentation and how it's not necessarily accurate. So it, it was really interesting, I think, doing this remote style of um, training uh, research assistants because we were forced to change certain things and that really highlighted some of the more uh, tech related challenges with assessment. Um, yeah. But yeah, training a research assistants is, is challenging. It's not, it's not easy. <laughs> no. um, so I don't see any questions in the Q and A box, but I did prepare a few questions and we do have a few minutes. And so kind of thinking about your experience, Dustin, with teleneuropsychology in the context of your survey results, what do you perceive as some of the barriers of teleneuropsychology becoming kind of more mainstream uh, for clinical practice? Great question. I think the, the biggest, uh, I think the, the two largest barriers are, um, the ability for providers to feel that they can assess, a, get, a, receive a comprehensive evaluation of patients, which I can speak to in a second. And the other part being ensuring that we have a large enough bandwidth infrastructure in the US 
to be able to provide these services. Um, the irony being that, um, that those individuals living in rural communities where rural assessment is where telehealth initially started up prior to the pandemic, those individuals are also less likely to have um, the bandwidth strong enough to be able to have an hour, hour and a half, two hour video assessment. Um, we, we know some, some good, uh, there's good data out there on the, uh, the high association between internet connectivity and income and also internet con connectivity and um, metropolitan location. And so there's, there's the irony there that uh, the, the folks who traditionally we would have considered needing it the most, um, they have the least likelihood of being able to have the, the technology to use it. But going back to the idea of uh, providers feeling like they can have the, they are able to get a comprehensive evaluation. As, as we all know, the, it's the, it's, there's a little, there's a difference between the remote clinic hybrid model, which I didn't get into, uh, but uh, it, was, it was mentioned a little bit earlier, where individuals would be in the clinic where you have a little more control of the data and control of the stimuli versus a purely direct to home testing model. And that model is, I mean, it's exclusionary of, I mean, video, or I'm sorry, um, visual spatial, uh, visual constructional capacity evaluation is still limited. Um, the test developers, uh, the idea of screen sharing, test developers, depending on who they are, they have different, uh, different permissions. And oftentimes most of those permissions are not as generous as it seems at face value. When you actually read the fine print, you're still not allowed to photocopy. For some things, you're still not allowed to screen share or mirror. And so if the participant's not able to see the, the, date, the image, obviously they're not able to remember it and record it. You're not able to, to assess for that modality. And so I feel like that's the biggest, um, those two pieces, the, the connectivity, but in particular, the visual spatial component of how do you assess that well enough? Um, because providers are, uh, providers, I think it's fair to say, People generally like tradition, uh, and they like to be able to make clinical interpretations based on things that information that they're comfortable with and in ways that they were trained on. And so there's just that uh, I think there's a doubt there that um, hopefully COVID has has truncated some of that, uh, bridged some of that gap. But I don't necessarily think it's bridged it the whole way. Um, what are your thoughts? No, I definitely agree that the test developers copyright issues do provide kind of a significant barrier. And I mean, above the concept of tradition, I think that just as human beings, we like things that are familiar, right? And having the large majority of providers train in person, um, it, it can become um, very uncomfortable and people don't like to feel uncomfortable. Um, one of the things that we had talked about at the last Meet the Experts is how our um, psychiatry colleagues and other colleagues who do some clinical trials of n newer um, methodologies just have to demonstrate non-inferiority, right? So can I at least demonstrate that my test via this modality isn't any inferior compared to having somebody in person might be a way to kind of overcome that uncomfortable barrier that a lot of us are experiencing in this moment. Um, and then maybe we need to take back the tests. <laughs> maybe we need to do something um, because it seems like money is definitely a significant driver for some of the tools that we have um, available to us to be able to tap into like the visuospatial memory domain. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really, um, it would be so much easier if we could have a, uh, whether it's the BM, BVMTR stimuli right up on the screen or the ray copy or anything like that. Uh, yeah, it, I feel like we're frequently uh, doing, doing some gymnastics and trying to find ways to, to utilize this. Yeah, excellent. Um, 
So I want to be mindful of time. We have about five minutes left, and I also don't want to be the monopolizer of all the questions. So I'll give people just a moment to think if they have any additional questions that, um, that they would like to ask. And you can put those in the Q&A box or in the chat. So would you like to talk, uh, Dustin, a little bit about the some of the unique challenges of assessing older adults via teleneuropsych modalities? Absolutely. Uh, from a, well, the, the idea that, and I do want to be mindful of everyone's time, so I'll, um, I'll try to be as succinct as possible, because there's a, there's a host of unique challenges when assessing older adults, which I know a lot of folks on the call have already thought about these things. But uh, from a sensory standpoint, we don't have eyes, we don't have ears, we don't have noses, we don't have uh, temperature control in that testing room where the patient is sitting. So we don't actually know if they've heard the information or seen the information properly. And while, while that is the case for direct in-person face-to-face testing, it's that while that's also the case, if you're in the room and you're a skilled clinician or you're a skilled technician, over time, you know cues of whether people are hearing properly or not. And it's, it's still very challenging to determine this over the screen. Additionally, if you're getting any kind of glitches in the, uh, in the connectivity, is the older adult going to be able to, uh, and not to stereotype individuals, but there is a, uh, of uh, older adults not having a good grasp on technology, because there are obviously a lot of uh, a lot of outliers and a lot of examples of that being uh, the case of uh, that being not the case. However, statistically speaking, older individuals are less likely to adapt the newest technologies, and so. Um, issues surrounding connectivity, bandwidth, just discomfort uh, being assessed over a computer screen when they have not been raised with exams or test sophistication using a computer. Those are all components as well. And there's a whole host of others that I could probably go into as well that don't really have the time to. Yeah. Um, And additionally, the idea of uh, from a from a and so uh, uh, Sonia's question is she's saying for example I also I have off, I've often encountered many instances when older adults cannot keep track of tasks like single uh, single digit modalities tests and that number one you're absolutely correct the uh, the insertion of someone into a testing environment for which they're not familiar only increases the level of complexity of any of the measures that we're assessing. And it's causing their brain to function at a higher level just by the nature or needing to function at a higher level just by the nature of their being there. Consequently, the ability, some of our tasks that we think are relatively straightforward are actually becoming a little bit of a, a divided attention task that we're not meaning to. And then when you factor in the fact that what, where, uh, do they have a designated computer to do this? Are they looking on their phone? Uh, are they, if, if they are a designated computer, how far away are they looking? Is that normally how far away they would be looking if it is any kind of, maybe not a visual spatial task, but there's a visual stimuli in there? Um, it, it can greatly impact uh, any individual, particularly individuals who may have sensory deficits of hearing or vision. Uh, yes, and Sonia is saying and exhausting their cognitive capacity fairly quickly. Absolutely, I agree with that. Well, we are at the top of the next hour. I just want to take the time to thank Dustin for going over his um, excellent manuscript and answering everyone's questions today. Thank you, everyone for your time and attendance. And we really enjoyed this Meet the Experts talk and we look forward to seeing everyone in a few months at our next scheduled one. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Take care, appreciate it. Hi, thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Michelle.
There you go.